This work is an independently made audio play of Book 1 of the Piper Wars Saga by Lillian Ashcroft and co-authors Will Spears and H.L. Gray, and is dedicated to the author's beloved wife and to all the love and warmth she has given them. Now, before we begin, let us first give a quick comment concerning canon and context relevant to this work. This series of books assumes is mostly canon. The original Peter Pan and the novel Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, with the exception of an alteration made to the ending of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in which our dear Alice fails to wake up from her dream and thus must accept that Wonderland is very, very real. The events of this book pick up exactly where these two original works leave off, with Alice fleeing the courtroom during her trial with the Red Queen. In the Neverlands, we pick up with Hook about an hour or two after being swallowed by the ticking croc. Now, before anyone in this beloved audience assumes that because we take as canon these two previously established works, that this audio play will be a long drudging stroll down paths already worn through a land of the dull and already familiar, let us assure you the journey will be a fascinating and intriguing path through elements both nostalgic and unexplored. Through both the known and the unknown, and it will be unlike any journey you have ever gone on. Whether you are partaking of this grand quest is for better or ill is a distinction we leave up to you, our dear travelers. With all that out of the way, please just let us say it is an honor to present this story for your enjoyment. Thank you for joining us on this adventure, and please enjoy the story. Episode 1, Part 1, Washed Ashore. The year is 1911 AD, Siren Shore, the far northeastern coasts of the Neverlands in the realm of Ishrakai. Small bits of shell roll to and fro as the churning waves of the sea heave starfish, seaweed, and a half-digested man onto the sunlit sand. Captain James Hook digs his bloody digits and stump into the coarse sediment. <coughs> The brutalized captain drags his decimated frame further up the beach before collapsing, his coat, pants, and boots lost in the churning gut of the crocodile. His sword is not lost, but rather left on purpose sticking halfway from the creature's belly. It had been the key to his escape from the croc's putrid stomach. Shivers and spasms squirm through his body. His torn white underclothes cling to his burnt and lacerated skin. The once beautiful hair of his head is now eaten by stomach acid. The captain coughs blood in seawater as sharp pain slices through him with every breath. With blurred vision, he scans the stormy sea as his mind fades out, wandering back to the moment of his bitter defeat. Peter Pan shimmers in his typical arrogant splendor, and they do their battle dance around each other, both of them looking for the right moment to strike as the boy continues to smirk at him. Pam, so cocky, so smug. <sighs> that little puke. Their blades clang jarringly as they trade blows. Hook stands firm on the deck as the boy leaps from a barrel onto a nearby railing. Rage burning, Hook charges. His blade leans in for the fatal kiss. Pan spins to the side, landing a glancing cut below Hook's knee sending him stumbling over the edge of the ship. Hook meets a geyser of salt water and beastly teeth as the croc leaps up from the waves below. The croc's bite takes his head and shoulders whole, pulling him in. Hook and the croc both fall back into the sea as he is swallowed completely. Peter blasted Pan. He was mine. Savage pain jolts from Hook's cracked ribs and weeping abrasions, pulling him back to the present. His eyes flutter, 
finally sensing the touch of rain upon his face. Stinging droplets whipping sideways from the gale storm, forming out at sea. He tries to wipe his eyes with his hand, only to find it stiff and unmoving. He lies a broken man without the strength to move, as each receding wave laps life away from him. Iron-willed, he summons up the last of his strength. He shoves with all his might, warring against the searing pain consuming him as he manages to roll onto his back. As he stares up at the scorched sky above the numbness taking him, a powerful boom erupts above him as great searing light bolts and builds within the blacking clouds. Another loud crack shatters the heavens as a searing white hot plasmatic bolt of energy tears from the sky, igniting the coastal waters. Captain Hook tries to rub away the prismatic phantoms left behind in his eyes, but his arms refuse him. He shakes his head weakly to avoid the burning of the brilliant light in his eyes, causing a wave of nausea to wash over him. Even with his eyes closed, he feels it until at last the sensation dulls and he reopens his eyes and his vision clears. Staring in bewilderment at the sight before him, atop the threshing wave strolls a figure. At first, the being seems to be a tall flame, orange and twisting through the veil of rain before abruptly sharpening into the form of a man. He appears gaunt with starvation, garbed in a pumpkin orange suit with black pinstripes. A long row of coal black buttons punctuates his jacket. A wide black leather belt clasped with a large golden buckle cinches his clothing tight at the waist before allowing the orange cloth to flare out over matching trousers. Black shiny dress shoes flash in unison with the light. The man steps onto the land before strolling cheerfully over to the beached and battered hook, crouching beside him. The jaunty man flips back the end of his scarf as it comes loose in the wind. His garment appears to be composed of hundreds of intricately cut and sewn rat pelts, giving it a heavy but dexterous nature. It clings like a lover to the man's neck. Warm greetings, Jay. I hope I'm not coming at a bad time. (laughs) Oh, my dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. You seem to be dying. And without your sword or your good hand. Tisk, tisk. Look at you. How pathetic. Unarmed and whimpering. That's no way for a man of adventure like you to die now, is it? Crying and weak like some prepubescent boy. Breaks my heart. Or at least it. Well, no matter. You truly are a tearful sight. No, this would do no, sir. This would do it all. No, a man, a man like you, ought to die in a feather bed upon a pile of plunder, cozy in lavish, ill-gotten luxury while being pleasured by a gaggle of young girls and tender boys trained in the art of debauchery. The stranger strokes Hook's cheek tenderly, examining his ravaged form with a sadistic smile before locking his eyes with Hook's. The strange being stares deep into Hook's soul. <laughs> My, my, how careless of me! Where are my manners? I never introduced myself. You probably have not heard of me. My exploits were made famous in, shall we say, a place your ships cannot sail. You may call me the Piper. The orange-clad twig of a man jumps to his feet and gives a mock bow before kneeling back down and leaning in close to Hook his face so close to Hook's that he could see that where there should have been a face, the man had only condensed swirling cosmos with the top of half his head garbed in a shimmering crimson skull-style death mask, and the bottom where there should have been a mouth of flesh was instead lips made of nebulous dust and universe molded into form. He pulls from within his sleeve a rolled-up document, which he whips open with a flourish. He presents the document to the dying captain, summoning forth a long quill with thin black plumage. The piper maneuvers the pen into Hook's bad hand. If you are indeed 
not ready to meet your watery compatriot, Davy Jones, you need only make your mark upon this parchment. You will be erased from the Book of Death and granted the power to dangle the Neverlands from the tip of your hook. The Piper places a kiss on Hook's stump, where his hook would normally be. Duh, Towns. Mistrustful to the end. <laughs> That's good. I don't need a broken child as my general in the Neverlands. I need you fighting. One day, I will require your sword for a great and glorious battle. And when it's done, we will be square. So, is it a deal? The piper bends his brow and grins, waiting for an answer, as Hook continues to lie on his back, bleeding out. His body is weak, bloated from salt water absorption, anchored to his frame by the two chunks of blue glacier hatred in his eyes. The piper holds his gaze on the captain. Then with a sudden violence, Hook stabs the quill into the end of his stump and begins to sign captain. But the piper lays a hand on the effort. Your proper name, if you please. Hook nods as the letters drag themselves out in the blotched and sea-sprayed parchment. Captain James W. Forden. As the end completes, his hand collapses to the sand. The last of his mortal strength spent. Yes, yes, right as rain, dee dee Oh, very good, sir. The piper claps excitedly for a moment before straightening up and rolling the parchment, slipping it back into his coat. The piper procures a small black flake and a thumb-sized clam from one of his coat pockets. Bending down with a shrug and a shake, he presses the clam into Hook's palm. These are for you. But to get started, grasp this, my boy. Use with care, for this is no ordinary mollusk. The piper's words are to no avail, as the barely breathing captain fails to respond, slipping in and out of consciousness. The piper frowns as his head rotates a full but slow clicking 360 degree rotation before snapping back into proper position. The piper shakes his head in deep dissatisfaction. Oh, now this won't do. No, not at all. You are too engrossed in death's requiem to get your orders. Oh, what to do, what to do. Well, desperate and all that. The piper smiles maliciously as he mashes the black flake into the end of Hook's bloody stump. The black flake sinks deep into the pale flesh of Hook's wrist nub, causing phantom wisps of dark blue and purple energy to bloom from the spot. Thin black tendril-like veins shift and twist, growing out and in. The tendrils burrow into the bone and muscle, crystallizing into an ebony lattice that spreads up above his elbow. Varicose charcoal veins stretch further up Hook's arm from under the newly formed lattice through his soldier and into his chest. <coughs> 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 The purple and blue surges of color streak through Hook's veins as his entire body convulses. Chasms of torn flesh knit together. Sagging muscles become piano wire. Dark hair sprouts from his scalp, stubble on his chin, and a thick black meadow of hair down his chest. After several moments, the spasms calm down to mere twitchings. Hook's closed eyes toss and turn as though he's suffering nightmares, and then an unfathomable calm sweeps over him. His breath steadies and his eyes open. The piper straightens up, gesturing for Hook to climb to his feet. Hook rises with a newfound strength. The piper unbuttons the top of his coat, reaches an arm into the elbow of his coat, and pulls out an impossibly long item. When you face Pat again, you will probably want this. Captain Hook's rapier sings its legend to the wind as the piper drags the shining blade through the air before turning and offering the blade back to its rightful owner. Its song continues to echo through Hook for a moment, resonating deep inside him. Hook reaches out, reclaiming the cherished weapon he had thought lost forever. He re-tightens what remains of his belt around his torn underclothes with his stump and 
his bad hand before securing his sword to it. He looks up at the piper and shreds out a grimace mm. grin. Bloody god fool. Hook looks down at the clam the piper gave him, tucking it into his belt as the piper sidles up, holding his hat down against the ferocious gusts of wind. Don't lose that clam, Captain. It will be your guide through the p- pale water. The pale waters? What would Captain Zames hook? The captain pauses as he lifts his now black lattice covered stump, sees his good hand, his hook missing, and frowns. What in those accursed waters? Your throne, of course. Hold the clam to the horizon, and it will show you the way. Hook carefully listens before nodding. Looking out to sea, Hook scans the coastline out to the storm-scorched horizon. The wind was blowing east by southeast. The last pen and I battled near Bruno's Rock. So, we must be on Mist Moon Island or Siren Soul. Very good, Captain. This is indeed Siren Shore. I'm afraid to say the storm was pushing your body ahead of it, but now that you are stationary, it will be upon you shortly. Lightning streaks overhead, illuminating the rain like diamonds, sketching the silhouettes of clouds and mountains in the distance. Clouds roll in over the white caps, bringing solid darkness ever closer. How long do I have before you require my steel? The piper strides over and slaps him on the back playfully before putting an arm around Hook's shoulders. Plenty of time, my boy. Enjoy yourself. Take a merboy to bed. Drink yourself into a stupor and get into a nice brawl or two. (laughs) Best we head inland, then. You go ahead, chum. My business draws me elsewhere. I trust you understand what you need to do. (laughs) <laughs> Hook nods as he turns and begins making his way towards the tree line, leaving the piper alone on the beach without another word. Episode 1, Part 2, Alice's Evidence Redux. The year is 1911 AD. The royal city of hearts in the land of hearts, Wonderland, the realm of Ishrakai. Off with her head. Nobody dares to move as Alice regains her monstrous size, towering over the courtroom. The entire court of royal guards rise into the air and come falling down upon the now giant lass. Oh, get off. Who cares for you at all? You're nothing but a pack of cards. Thrashing in frustration, she succeeds at beating them off of her. Alice turns, crashing a massive hole in the wall. The young girl dashes between thick trunks and giant ferns. Her dress tears against the sharp limbs of the many broad, sharp-leafed bushes. Their razor-like leaves rake her arms, leaving deep cuts. The sharp limbs and briars shred her dress as she surges onward with no care for the pain, lost in the adrenaline of the moment. However, as the adrenaline fades and the pain comes and goes, a pleasant new sensation pulses through her. It spreads through her body in waves, sending new sensations cascading through her mind like a great tide, making the world appear oil-painted. Lost in tactile euphoria, she caresses the plants, trying to smear their colors into a veil, as the sound of her own laughter splashes the world in a shifting array of colors and scents. Familiar images morph out of the air before her as she sees a multitude of cat smiles stretch out through the painted world around her. She tries to focus on the nearest smile, but as soon as her eyes catch it, it disappears. 
Walls of trees and shadows shift as she resumes moving through them, pushing aside drooping sunflowers, taking their evening naps, and clusters of bees discussing the day's events among themselves. Drawn on as if by some invisible force, she presses onward eventually stumbling upon a badger in front of an easel and canvas. On the canvas is a painting of another badger in front of its own easel and canvas. Would you stop moving? I'm trying to fix your ears. I would, but I'm trying to fix this one's feet while he keeps moving, replies the badger in the painting. Alice watches the scene unfold before her until the sky suddenly darkens, causing her to look up and behold a long brush descending from the sky. Glances towards the badger. Look, both of you stop moving. When I finish your ears, then you can finish that one's feet. Alice screams and leaps back at the booming voice and descending brush from the heavens. The smaller earthly badger jumps at her voice, causing the tip of the descending godly brush to smudge his tail and right paw, causing those parts of his body to suddenly disintegrate into a plasmatic mist of glowing wispy detritus. Blast it, girl! You made him move! The angry, thunderous voice from above the clouds sends Alice running off through the trees once more. After what feels like an eternity of running, she finally collapses, sprawling out on the floor of the dense, dark forest panting with exhaustion. Now I know you're mad. Who weeps after they are triumphant? Cheshire's voice dances from a disembodied mouth that shifts out of a nearby tree branch with the rest of the cat's ethereal body only semi-condensing into form. Cheshire swings down from the branch and crouches in the shade of some giant pansy flowers. His form comes to Alice as impressions. The line of his back which in fluxing spasms shows itself to be the cut of a leaf. The glow of his eyes is waning and waxing while his long, narrow smile is the most solid of his aspects. Over whom have I triumphed? I'm lost in a forest that has no end, and I'll never get back home. Oh my, was it an enemy or a friend? Who told you this forest has no end? Is it not endless? You tell me. You were not in the forest when you were in the courtroom, right? Alice nods weakly as she listens to the cat's words. So would it not make sense that if the forest ends at the Royal City of Hearts, then it should also end at other places too? Oh, this is all way too much. I want to go home. Well, there is only one way to do that. You mean there is a way? If you're here, there must be. Doors open both ways, after all. The only question is, are you strong enough to make the journey? Journey? There is a tower, white as the moon, that lies beyond the shadowed forest over the wall of the farthest edge and past the mountains of the Forbidden North. If a way home is what you truly desire, only there will you find it. Cheshire's grin grows wider as Alice climbs to her feet. Still trembling, she wipes the tears from her eyes. Then I shall go at once. Take heed, Alice. This journey is not for the weak-willed. It will require courage and determination far beyond that of a mere child, if you should fail to make it to the White Tower by the final midnight of the second month of this journey. The path to the tower will become lost to you. You will never be able to return home, and you will be left to wander the cold and twisted wilds forever. Alice's spirit wavers slightly as the cold snake of fear slithers up her spine, but she remembers her promise, one made long ago, the most important promise of her life, and she resolves she cannot allow herself to stay here. She must get home. Thank you, dear cat. I am forever grateful to you. Alice pulls the cat in close, embracing him warmly in her arms. I am glad to be of help, but hear me, dear Alice. The path you must take is guarded not by mad queens of foolish cards, but by the foulest beasts and most wicked of monsters. Be vigilant, and be brave, for you will find no mercy along this quest. I understand. Alice kisses the cat's soft, fluffy head before turning her back to Great Feline and taking off at a full sprint into the woods, her heart filled with all the determination she can muster. After about an hour of running, she comes to a much-needed stop. Out of breath and exhausted, she stumbles forward slowly, passing beyond the tree line into a large circular clearing of luminescent purple and blue grass waving in the wind. 
Sleeping dandelions speckle the ethereal clearing as chattering roses converse among themselves concerning Alice's intruding presence. The flowers are far larger than any she had ever seen, and apparently far more suspicious concerning strangers. Alice can see a massive flower bulb towering over the center of the clearing. That's when she feels it, a touch against her ankles, as blue and purple glowing vines begin spiraling their way up between her legs, over her privy parts, and up further, coiling around her stomach and breasts, feeling every part of her. Smaller vines sprout out from the larger ones, tracing the contours of her face. An unknown heat washes over her, draining her of strength and rendering her limp and helpless. The smell of the vines assaults her nostrils, saturating her skin. The large flower bulb in the middle of the clearing shimmers with an unearthly aura of light as it blooms. From out of the bulb wafts a familiar voice. That's enough. She is safe. Or at least she is no threat. Not to me, anyway. There, lounging in the middle of a giant bloom flower bulb, is the caterpillar from before, smoking his hookah and giggling to himself gleefully. The vines heed their master's command and stop their increasingly invasive groping. Little murmurs can be heard as they return to the ground, sulking. <laughs> I'm so sorry about my touchy vines, but they are just very protective of me. They are a bit invasive. Oh, they can be, when they are enjoying their job more than usual, or when they are especially concerned for my well-being. But I sincerely apologize, dearest little one. Tell me please, Mr. Caterpillar, do you know of the wall at the farthest edge? Of course. You must not dally in getting there. A long journey awaits you. And everything depends on your success. What do you mean by everything? Why, everything that is to come, of course. But no time for that now. There is a station about an hour north of here, with a train you must catch. It should take you straight to the base of the wall. A train? How convenient. Yes, it is. But you must go now. Hurry, or you will never catch it. When you get there, check your right pocket. After all, trains require tickets. Alice nods, running off towards the train station. The forest rolls up and down, thinning out into large swaths of meadow, patched with dark glades as she runs, rounding a group of trees housing a raucous family of parrots. Alice, at last, reaches the train station. Its ornate, blazing lanterns light up the boardwalk and its surroundings. Attendees lean from compartment doorways, howling, All aboard! As Alice hurries into the closest car, she sees countless tiny legs protruding from beneath the train car. To her shock, the whole train appears to be a massive centipede with compartments strapped to its back using reinforced leather. The exhausted young girl lets herself collapse onto a nearby seat as the train begins to move. Checking her right pocket, she finds a train ticket has somehow made its way into her possession. In the train are aardvarks and badgers, hamsters and kingfishers, a Welsh corgi and iguana, bears and wombats. Some eat silkworms, others curried cauliflower. Clover-scented smoke plumes up from ashtrays as newspapers flop open. The mood is that of settling in, a warmth both cozy and familiar. Alice sinks comfortably into her aisle seat. Beside her, a brown spotted spider sips from a cup so small it can only hold a single drop of tea. Hello. Much to her surprise, the gentlemanly spider not only speaks to her, but also tips its hat as well. Hello to you too, tiny spider. It's very nice to meet you. Do you know who will be checking my ticket? What do you mean? No one will check your ticket, little one. You just needed to get on the train. In fact, checking tickets sounds like the silliest job that could ever exist. Well, that makes sense, I guess. Still, they are very trusting not to check it. Alice puts the ticket back into her pocket as the spider moves his tiny cup to his fangs and sips. There is a large golden Labrador pushing a fully loaded silver cart down the aisle towards them. 
The cart is loaded with snacks, treats, soups, salads, and all manner of gourmet meals, alongside an oversized pot of tea in all sizes of cups. Would you like some tea? I'm not sure. I'm exhausted. I wouldn't want to fall asleep and let it get cold. Cold, you say? Why would your falling asleep affect the weather, my lady? Well, perhaps just a small sip of tea, then. Um, okay. Yeah. Perhaps a small nip would be nice. Thank you. One small nip of tea coming right up, lass. The Labrador's words caused the top cup on a stack of tiny cups to spring to life, jumping down off the stack. The tiny teacup makes its way over to the teapot, which smiles gleefully in response. Alice notices the teapot has no spout, just a face infused with enthusiasm. The teacup closes in on the spoutless pot, causing the bottom of the pot to morph and twist, forming four legs that raise the pot so that the cup may get below its front curve. The tiny teacup settles itself in front of the pot as the spout forms between the two front legs of the pot. Steaming hot tea pours into the teacup. The porcelain skin of the cup and the pot both seem to blush. Once the cup is full, the spout vanishes back into the pot and the legs retract, lowering the pot back down onto the tray. The tiny cup waddles slowly onto a nearby tea saucer, being careful not to spill any of its precious piping hot content. The tea saucer sprouts tiny legs of its own and makes its way over to where Alice is sitting and sits itself down on the small passenger table in front of her. There you go, my lady. One small nip of tea on the house. A cute blonde thing like you does not happen through here every day, you know. The large Labrador smiles and winks before turning his gaze back to his duties, serving the other commuters on the train. The tea tastes herbal but sweet, like honey chamomile, and something else she doesn't know. It has a bitter, unfamiliar aftertaste. She lifts a hand to ask for a little sugar to counteract the bitterness, but the Labrador has already moved on. Not wanting to be a bother, she gives up and continues sipping her tea. Alice turns to the spider once more, her lips tingling from the tea. She considers asking the spider if he has ever been to the wall and how long the trip is supposed to last. These are, of course, the most logical questions to ask in this situation. At the last second, she realizes she won't get a satisfactory answer to such questions. It will probably be something like, it takes as long as it takes or some other correct and yet nonsensical retort. Two threads intertwine in the tapestry of her mind, and the words to speak become clear to her. Mr. Spider? Yes, little one? Do you know any good stories? I would love to hear one. A story to keep you awake, or a story to help you sleep? Whichever one is your favorite to tell. Alice lays her head back against the seat as the spider tells his favorite story to her. Although she listens to the story, she does not comment or ask questions as she normally would. Finishing the tea, she sets the cup back down and turns her gaze towards the curtains covering the nearby windows as they undulate. None of the windows are open, so it can't be the wind. It is as if small fingers on the other side of the curtain are gently tugging on it. She exhales deeply, drifting off as she feels herself fall inward through her seat until at last she finds herself inside the spider's story, standing beside the goat with three brains and watching him sketch. The world feels slowed and dulled as she becomes abruptly aware of the true viscous nature of her skin. She oozes deeper into her chair, her mind far away. Cheshire slithers from underneath a nearby suitcase. He smiles at her, dancing his strange jig in the air. Outside the window, bats fly in a great black cloud. Stars shine beside the dozing moon, illuminating the grassy meadows below, casting shadows beneath short, rocky protrusions. Millions of tiny legs carry the train across the miles stretched out before them. Alice fades further out, lost within the great vastness of herself. Her lip quivers, the spell of sleep filling her like low-frequency waves of dark weight dragging her even further down into the abyss. 
The spider sips his tea, droning on about the three-brained groat abandoning his bag of tools as Alice pierces the murky surface of her own consciousness and slips into deepest dreams. Down, down, ever downward she falls into deepest dream as a new world rises into form around her. Jeffrey from school chuckles like a gleeful aristocrat, setting his martini down on the white table linen. Servers dart back and forth between all the occupied tables. Alice spears a dainty bite of swordfish. It is tasteless, but quite good. Jeffrey's lineless face smiles at her. His hair is slicked back with pomade, and he's sporting his finely tailored tweed jacket. History lessons would be so much more enjoyable if Mrs. Brisby wouldn't gloss over the dirty bits, don't you agree? Jeffrey smirks, the dark glint of his eyes hiding something sharp and dangerous that she cannot decipher. Everything feels hyper-mundane, as if distilled into some form of normal far purer than normalcy. Realization of the current setting strikes Alice abruptly, causing her to scatter her attention all around excitedly. I must be back in England. I'm back, but how? Oh, what does it matter? I finally returned to my old life. How long have I been gone? A toast. Jeffrey raises his new martini meaningfully. <laughs> to what? She cannot hear herself, but knows she said it. Why? To our tenth anniversary, of course. You don't think I pulled strings to get us in here just because it's Thursday? No, of course not. How silly of me. Happy anniversary, dear. Alice raises her glass of Pinot Grigio half-heartedly as a dull, slithering uneasiness rives deep inside her. Shouldn't I be happier on such an occasion? My handsome husband has taken me out to the best restaurant in town for a tenth anniversary. Why am I not ecstatic? She tries to remember if she has ever felt joy or even mild happiness in a dream. She can recall being frightened in several dreams, but never happy. Perhaps this accounts for the washed-out nature of this place. Maybe something is just wrong in me. Broken deep inside, maybe. What shall we do this evening, darling? Hurry home and cuddle up to a nice romantic fire and talk about the local football matches? <laughs> Jeffrey always loved talking about the local football matches. He was always so passionate about the game and not half bad at playing it. Actually, I had other plans for this evening. He moves his hand under the table, sliding it up past her thigh and under her dress. He looks at her in a way she does not understand, both strange and somehow predatory, as if simmering with primal hunger. Her heart jolts. At first she thinks she's afraid. However, she can feel another more exciting feeling blazing somewhere in the back of her mind, ignited by the heat of the moment. Something new is happening to her, inside her. She feels feverish, poisoned by a toxic concoction of fearful confusion and arousing curiosity. What is that look in his eye? What is this feeling? Should I still feel whatever this amazing feeling is about my husband after all these years? Wait, how many years has it been? But I'm not that old. Or am I? How old am I? How old is he? He still looks like the boy from school. Stop. What's going on? Where is his hand going? I have never done this, or have I? No, surely not, never. I'm still only a child. What's he doing? He's still a child, too. We aren't old enough to be married. Questions strike like lightning, scorching the storm cloud of her mind. Why can't I breathe? Why can't I move? What is this tense, tingling sensation burning inside? Time passes by and fast forward. People get up from their tables and new people arrive. Alice doesn't recognize any of the other faces. They're all talking, but she can't take any of it in. Their words crash over her and drain away. Her insides twist into a tight, wrenching nodule of anticipation. Something is going to happen. Something I want. Something I need badly, but what? 
Jeffrey yanks her hand. Caught up in the rush of motion, they run. She trips on the heeled boots and bumps tables, flinging them about the room with awesome power, scattering glass and utensils. What about the bill? We haven't paid. They are outside. Meteors rip through the sky, plummeting down upon the surrounding city. They run over strewn piles of bombarded cement and mounds of debris. Tension builds in her hips as running becomes harder. Her muscles clench tight, preventing her from moving. Frantic reality accelerates towards some grand cataclysm, some apocalyptic explosion that will bring erasure. It's coming. It's coming. Reality shatters and freezes as a great darkness consumes the sky. It descends as it expands. A new kind of scream erupts from her, soundless and penetrating. Alice awakens, still screaming. Alice jerks awake violently, panting and sweaty. Well-dressed fruit bats flap their wings in agitation. Anteaters extend their tongues in annoyance. The train is stopped. Two Pomeranians step in dragging burlap sacks. Alice hears loud barking commands coming from the car ahead of her. She leans to look, spotting several of the Red Queen's card men point weapons at passengers, yapping orders to move. They brandish a picture and ask the passengers something. Without a second thought, Alice says goodbye to the gentlemanly spire and hurries off the train. Other passengers carry suitcases up and down the platform. Attendants cry, all aboard! The train doors close, and the million tiny legs ripple with movement once again. After the glimpse of the card men on the train, Alice feels even more certain of the target on her back, like a million predatory eyes watching her every move. Her body feels surprisingly well rested, yet still slightly numb from the tea. She bolts around the station to avoid detection. Roads stretch out from the station platform in all directions. She looks farther down the tracks, and off into the distance stands the wall of the farthest edge, looming the whole stretch of the horizon like a towering mountain range, cut uniformly by godly scissors.